Good evening, everyone. Welcome once again to Bhagavad Gita Satsang. I'm Hari Kirtan Das. It's an honor for me to be here with you. No, it's an honor for you to be here with me. It's a pleasure for me to be here with you. It's an honor to have you here with me. And I suppose if I'm lucky, you heard me bollocks that all up. Uh, please let me know by hitting the little hand sign uh, in your chat. Uh, part. Oh, there you go. Okay. I can be heard. Hopefully I will not uh, fumble the rest of the class uh, quite the same way I fumbled my introductory remarks. And uh, it's very nice to see you all here. Uh, some of you, uh, please uh, forgive me for being a little slow on my correspondence, but thank you very much for writing to me. I deeply appreciate it. I'm always very happy to hear from you. You will hear from me soon. Meanwhile, back here, let's take care of our usual little bit of housekeeping. So for those of you who are new to the satsang, you can adjust your audio and viewing options up in the upper right hand corner. Need not worry about your video or your microphone. So there's no, uh, nothing I can see through the camera on your computer. You can see uh, me and I presume hear me as well. Therefore, if you would like to make yourself heard, in response to anything I have to say, use the chat window, or if you like, the uh, Q&A box is also available to you. Last week, we finished up chapter 15, the Yoga of the Supreme Person. We spoke about the fallible and the infallible, how Krishna is beyond infallibility, which is pretty far out, uh, and the fulfillment of confidential knowledge. We're gonna pick up with where we left off on the different levels of uh, secrets, actually, in the Bhagavad Gita. So we'll do a little wrap up on chapter 15, and then we will jump into chapter 16, the yoga of differentiating between divine and demonic natures. We will look at the characteristics of saintly persons. There are 26 of those. Characteristics of demonic persons. Uh, 24 qualities of, uh, is it 24? Let's find out. Um, 26, yes, 26 qualities of uh, saintly persons, uh, six qualities of demonic persons, and Krishna will tell us which is better just in case we couldn't figure it out. Before we go any further, we will chant our invocation mantra. So for those of you who are new to transliterated Sanskrit, Sanskrit rendered in the Roman alphabet, the marks are called diacritics. They let us know how different letters are to be pronounced. So the dot over an M indicates closing our lips at the same time that we close the back of our tongue to the roof of our mouth, a bar over a vowel indicates a longer and more open rendition of that vowel without the bar, a shorter and more uh, compressed version of the vowel. So I will chant our invocation mantra and if you like, you can chant it back. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya I offer my respects to the Supreme Person, the Son of Vasudev, who is the all-pervading transcendence. The son of Vasudev, of course, being Krishna, the speaker of the Bhagavad Gita. So we finished up chapter 15 with verse number 20. And Krishna reiterates how he has uh, provided Arjuna and by extension us with the most secret teaching of the Vedas. 
And therefore, we can understand that what the Bhagavad Gita is giving us is a secret that's hiding in plain sight. So a quick review. Earlier in our series, I spoke about four levels of instruction in the Bhagavad Gita. This is when uh, we were in chapter nine, the Yoga of Royal Secrets, verses one through three. That's class number 46, for those of you who are keeping score. Uh, and that class was on January 24th of this year. There are general instructions, then secret instructions called guya, more secret instructions, by which I mean not uh, numerically more, but deeper secrets called guyatar, and then the most secret instructions, guyatam. So these three words, guya, guyatar, and guyatam, indicate confidential, more confidential, most confidential. Uh, grammatically, you could think of them as good, better, best or positive, comparative, and superlative. Uh, primary education, undergraduate education, postgraduate education, and doctorate is another way to understand all four of these. So let's take a closer look. In chapters two through three, we received general instruction. So for ordinary people to gain freedom from attachments associated with having a material body, uh, we get the general or baseline instruction. We are not this material body. So Krishna identifies part of Arjuna's problem, the, the root cause of Arjuna's dilemma as to whether or not he should fight, uh, is he is despairing over the imminent deaths of all the fighters. So despair over the body is uh, refuted from the standpoint of knowledge on the basis of the eternality of the soul, the certainty of birth and death of the material body. And then Krishna goes on to differentiate the vision of a yogi from the vision of an ordinary person. Uh, and uh, from there he heads into karma mishra bhakti. Uh, that is to say, uh, action, karma, uh, that becomes a sacrifice, an offering, rather than something one does just for oneself. Then the secret or positive instructions are found in chapters four and five, where we hear knowledge of Brahman, the spiritual substance of which everything is made. We hear about symptoms of the person in Brahman realization, uh, and get some sense of what that is like. So this um, would be a jnana mitra bhakti or uh, devotion informed by knowledge or action uh, with a devotional um, over overtone informed by knowledge. Then more secret or comparative instructions show up in chapter six and eight, where we hear knowledge of the super soul, the paramatma. So we get the different categories of living beings, uh, the difference between the soul and the super soul, um, how uh, renunciation alone is incomplete, how Brahman realization is uh, also incomplete, uh, and that the realization of paramatma even though it's a higher realization, is easier to attain. This is the object of meditation for the mystic yogis, and therefore yoga mishra bhakti, uh, devotional action that is informed by mysticism or uh, mystic yoga practice. Most secret or superlative instructions are given in chapters 9 through 11, where Krishna describes pure devotional service or Ananya Bhakti Yoga. Which brings us to what we got in chapter 15. So if you go back to chapter 15 and look at the different verses, what we find is a reiteration of these different groupings of secrets. We get general knowledge in verses one through five, 
and then again in 7 through 11, and again in 16. So you see, once again, on a smaller scale, we have this kind of uh, looping style of instruction, this elliptical movement of uh, knowledge. Then we get secret knowledge in verse number six, more secret knowledge in verses 12 through 15 and 17 through 18, and then Krishna finishes this relatively short chapter with the most secret instructions in verses 19 through 20. So if you go back and look at chapter 15 from the standpoint of these different levels of knowledge, general, secret, more secret, most secret, then you can see how these verses correspond to these different levels of knowledge and how Krishna elliptically works his way uh, through each of these levels of knowledge once again. So that's our wrap up for chapter 15. If you have any last questions on what we covered in chapter 15 or what I just summarized with regard to these different levels of knowledge, go ahead and pop those in the chat. I will keep my eye out for your questions. And we will therefore move on to our verses for this week, chapter 16, one through six. So as is our usual way of doing things, I will read through the translation of each verse, then come back and we can look at each verse in detail. So here we go. Starting with verse number one from the 16th chapter, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna, said, Fearlessness, purification of one's existence, the cultivation of spiritual knowledge, charity, self-control, performance of sacrifice, study of the Vedas, austerity, simplicity. Text number two. Nonviolence, truthfulness, freedom from anger, renunciation, tranquility, aversion to fault finding, compassion for all living entities, freedom from covetousness, gentleness, modesty, steady determination. Verse three, vigor, forgiveness, fortitude, cleanliness, and freedom from envy and from the passion for honor. These transcendental qualities, O son of Bharat, belong to godly men endowed with divine nature. Text four. Pride, arrogance, conceit, anger, harshness, and ignorance. These qualities belong to those of a demonic nature. O son of Prita. Text five. The transcendental qualities are conducive to liberation, whereas the demonic qualities make for bondage. Do not worry, O son of Pandu, for you are born with the divine qualities. Text six. O son of Prita, there are two kinds of beings in this world. One is called divine and the other demonic. I have already explained to you at length the divine qualities. Now hear from me of the demonic. So those are the verses we will cover this evening. And let's go back now and look at them individually. All right. So in verses one through three, we get 26 divine or saintly qualities. And what I'm going to do is go through almost all of them individually and see what we find in the meaning of the word. Also, the order is kind of an interesting thing. Uh, and it's very purposeful. And there's a correlation to the Vedic system of Vanashram, Varna and Ashram, social divisions and stages of life. So we're gonna take a look at how these, this list 
corresponds to different people at different social stations and at different stages of their life. So here we go. All right. The first uh, thing we'll look at are the social divisions. So we've uh, looked at this in the past. Here's another way of looking at it. The Brahmanas are the head of the social body. They're at the top of the social pyramid. The Kshatriyas, Arjuna is a Kshatriya, warrior, administrator, governmental person. Uh, they're the next ones up. Uh, then moving down through the pyramid, the Vaishyas, the entrepreneurs, the business people in charge of farming and commerce are next. And then Shudra, uh, the legs of society, the people who make it all go, uh, those who are skilled at various uh, tasks uh, and can therefore work for the Vaishyas, employees, in other words. Uh, there is below these official four social divisions, a kind of subclass uh, of, uh, of people. Uh, but for the purpose of our conversation this evening, uh, we won't deal with that. So in addition to these social divisions, we also have uh, four different stages of life, student life, when you are, let's say you have a lifespan of 100 years, just to make the math easy. And because that's about how long anyone gets in Kali Yuga. So from one to 25, uh, zero to 24 and the last day. Uh, student life, when you're a young person, your business is to learn. Uh, from 25 to 50 or thereabouts, ideally, one then enters into household life and finds their uh, occupation, their way to make money in the world and starts a family and that sort of thing. Uh, after one's 50th year, you start to wind down. You let go of your business, your children are grown uh, and therefore no longer dependent on you. So. Uh, you wind down and start to retire. And then the renounced order of life all the way at the very end. Uh, and this is where we'll uh, pick up our discussion of the very first few words of the first verse of this chapter. So Krishna curiously begins with abhayam, fearlessness. Then sattva sangsudhi, purification of one's existence, and then jnana, knowledge. So these are the qualities of a sannyasin or a sannyasi, uh, depending on which variation of the word you look for. So when someone gets to the end of their stages of life, in the Vedic system, properly speaking, uh, one is supposed to take sannyas. So in Sanskrit, sannyas means renunciation or more literally abandonment. Uh, it's a combination of sam uh, and uh, which means to uh, collectively, uh, ni, which means down and asa, uh, to throw or to put. So laying everything down, putting everything down, uh, letting go of everything is what sannyas means. And the sannyas uh, order or that kind of, this kind of renunciation isn't just a matter of a stage of life, it's a matter of what kind of person can do that. Well, a Brahmin can do that. And therefore, uh, the formal order of renunciation called sannyas is really intended for the Brahmin. So the sannyasi is all the way at the top of the social division because they are Brahmins and they are complete renunciates. You can be a householder and be a, a Brahmin. You can be retired and be a Brahmin. Uh, you can be a student and be a Brahmin. But a sannyasi uh, is characterized by these three things. Uh, fearlessness, uh, purification of one's existence and knowledge. So by virtue of these three qualities, 
uh, and their ability to have just let everything go, they are considered to be the topmost of the top portion of the social divisions. So why fearlessness? Because to let everything go, you have to be fearless. You are essentially saying, I'm completely dependent on the Supreme Person to take care of me. I'm not going to make an effort to uh, see to my own material well-being. Uh, I will simply depend on others uh, who will be conduits of the mercy of the Supreme Person uh, and offer transcendental knowledge to those who are receptive to it uh, on the assumption that if I just go about doing Krishna's business, acting as uh, a missionary of the Supreme Person, then the Supreme Person is fully able to take care of uh, whatever I need and look out for all of my best interests. Well, you know, I think that uh, you got to be pretty brave to do something like that. So that's why fearlessness comes first. And that's why Krishna is speaking about these qualities first, because he's speaking about the qualities of one who is in the stage of life and the social position of a renunciate, sannyas. Notice how purification comes before knowledge. We've spoken before about how your state of being determines what you can know. So Krishna says, first, your state of being is you purify your existence, then comes knowledge. So knowledge is a function of purification. And that level of purification, the topmost level of purification uh, requires this letting go of the material world, which requires fearlessness. Hence, Krishna is working in this order. So uh, let's come back to uh, this for a moment. Um, but uh, Yeah, okay. So uh, the next ones are uh, charity self-discipline, and the performance of sacrifice. So these three are specifically for the householders that are situated in the middle social divisions, the kshatriya or the warrior class, the ruling class, you could say, and the vaisha, the entrepreneurial class. So this is expected uh, of them. Householders are expected to make money and particularly the entrepreneurs uh, and uh, are the ones who generate wealth. Therefore, they're expected to give in charity. Uh, the kshatriyas are administrators who collect all the taxes from the vaishas and they are also meant to be charitable about how they distribute uh, all the money that comes to them that they need in order to execute the responsibilities of good governance. Um, and then uh, controlling the mind is another way to say uh, self-discipline. Uh, being ethical. We've spoken at length about uh, the relationship of the teachings of the Bhagavad Gita and the ethics of yoga, and they will come up again in just a moment. And doing whatever it is you do as a sacrifice. So once again, this pertains to the different levels of knowledge. In the uh, Bhagavad Gita, we spoke earlier about um, how performance of work as a sacrifice is actually in the category of general instructions. This is basic, basic uh, information for uh, householders who have access to money. Now, Shudras also may have access to money, they may be very well compensated for what they do, uh, but because they are not wealth generators in the same way that the Vaishas are, uh, they're not expected, uh, it's not required of them to uh, engage in uh, charity, nor is the same level of self-discipline and sacrifice expected 
uh, as well. Study of Vedic literature is for anyone in the first stages of their life. So this pertains specifically to students. Uh, now, of course, this is good for anybody at any stage of life at uh, any position in the social divisions, but it is uh, specifically uh, the responsibility of those in the early stages of their life to engage in uh, study. Austerity is the next one, and that is specifically for those who are retired, those who are, are giving up their household life. So for some time, uh, you're working, you're making money, uh, you're expanding your material life. And then when you get to the point of retirement, it's not like you go down to Florida and live on top of the world or any of those other retirement communities where you're supposed to play golf and tennis and go swimming and play mahjong all the time. Uh, it's just not like that. Um, retirement in the Vedic system that is the context that Krishna is speaking about means that you let go. You gradually let go uh, of your material life. You um, give up all the stuff you've acquired with the understanding that you can't take it with you. So this is intelligence. And then simplicity is the last one in this verse, and that's for everybody in every stage of life, in every social division. Uh, Krishna urges us to simplify things. Don't make your life complicated. Uh, don't get entangled with trying to exploit the resources of material nature that are just going to uh, wind up having you more deeply entangled in the complexities of material nature. Keep it simple. And that takes us to the end of this verse. So do you have any questions about that or any comments about what we've talked about here? And in what social division are we in? Well, uh, I can't speak for everybody. Um, remember the social divisions are a function of qualities and the kind of work you're attracted to doing. And, you know, in Kali Yuga, it gets complicated because, uh, you know, you can be a Brahmin, you know, spiritually enlightened intellectual, but you could also be a householder. And, you know, what it takes to be an entrepreneur, you may not have that particular samskara, that particular impression on the mind that just makes you naturally good at it. And also it may complicate your life to try to run a business. It may just be easier for you to maintain yourself by uh, you know, getting a job at somewhere. Um, and I know people who have that uh, exact situation. They're uh, very expert at performing sacrifice and uh, rituals. They're uh, uh, very purified, elevated people uh, who uh, can tell you which aisle to go find the hardware you're looking for at Lowe's. So it's a little complicated. As a general rule in Kali Yuga, it's understood that uh, practically everybody is a Shudra. Uh, and then there are Shudras with a little bit of Vaishya uh, imprint and they're naturally good at business. So they're Shudras with some Vaishya qualities uh, or uh, Shudras with uh, some sense of chivalry and therefore kshatriya qualities or it's such, such like that. Um, but now this also will come up in the subsequent verses in terms of how we are uh, advised to think about ourselves and conduct ourselves in the world. So as a general rule, uh, everyone's birth in Kali Yuga is not so great. Um, and therefore, it's a very even playing field. And then we have 
inclinations to be a certain way, to be an intellectual, to be a warrior, to be a business person, to be a, a skilled worker of some kind. Uh, so it's not as clear cut in our current situation as it might have been when uh, Krishna spoke the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, I'm not sure, it could have been complicated then too. Anyway, uh, Kamarada, I hope that answers your question, at least satisfactorily for now. And uh, we will delve a little deeper into this uh, at very question uh, as we move forward. And we move forward into blankness, but only for a moment because this next verse is the verse that we're going to chant together. So I'll explain a little bit more about the transliterated Sanskrit and the diacritical marks. The dot over the M and the bar over the vowel I have already explained. We pronounce each letter that we um, see in the transliterated Sanskrit. So an H after a consonant means you just put some air after that consonant. A dot under an H means a short stop on the vowel that preceded it unless it appears at the end of a word at the end of a line. An accent mark over an S is a SH sound, but it's sounded from the back of your mouth, and therefore a lower pink noise kind of SH sound as opposed to a regular shh white noisy SH sound. <laughs> a V at the end is usually an indication of a euphonic combination in order to make a connection to the next word. So a V will roll right into the vowel that begins the word that uh, comes after it. A dot under an S is a regular SH sound. And a C is always a CH sound, but it's not a CH sound right between, uh, behind your teeth, but rather a CH, CH sound. So you're gonna curl your tongue up into the center of the roof of your mouth to make that CH sound. And that, I hope, explains that. And with that, I will chant each line, and if you like, you can chant each line back. Here we go. Ahimsa satyam akrodhas. Tyaga shantir apai shunam. Naya bhute shvalo luptham. Mardavam hrir achapalam. Translation. Nonviolence, truthfulness, freedom from anger, renunciation, Tranquility, aversion to fault finding, compassion for all living entities, freedom from covetousness, gentleness, modesty, steady determination. So here, uh, Krishna is kind of uh, mid stride in uh, his description of these 26 qualities. So now let's look at these in detail. So ahimsa, we hear this of course in uh, yoga. This is usually the first thing we hear about if we are yoga teachers or learning to become yoga teachers. Uh, when we study yoga philosophy, what we actually get first usually is ethics and ahimsa is right at the top of the list of ethical imperatives. So ahimsa, non-violence, a, a negating prefix, hingsa, hurting, non-hurting, non-harming, non-violence, ahimsa. Uh, here's a way to think about ahimsa. Uh, 
It means to not impede the progress of any living entity, irrespective of the life form that they have. So uh, just because the spirit soul within the body, the atma within a body can't be killed doesn't mean that uh, there's no harm in killing someone, uh, whether they be in a human body or an animal body or a plant body or what have you. Uh, if we kill for some selfish motivation, there's going to be a bad karmic reaction because what we've done is interfered with the progression of a person through their own karma. So for example, if uh, I have a destiny to take birth as a ladybug for X amount of time, and before that time is up, someone squashes me just because, although, I mean, come on, who does that to a ladybug? Only a demonic person does that. So let's say uh, I'm, a, I'm in a body that uh, you know, is either not so attractive or might be useful to someone to satisfy some selfish desire. Um, well, now that person is gonna have to take birth in that same body again to finish out the string and they've experienced this interruption that is uh, violence that we have to be held accountable for. So whenever we engage in unnecessary violence, you're allowed to defend yourself, um, then there's a bad karmic reaction to that. And the uh, notion that uh, the person in the body is not slain when the body is slain is not um, an excuse. It doesn't make it okay. So this is, of course, the argument for uh, not harming animals for food in yoga. Uh, uh, the most obvious uh, example of this is the idea that a yogi uh, adopts a vegetarian diet, a diet where there's no or at least a minimal amount of harm to other living entities involved. And this was actually one of the very first things I understood when I started getting interested in yoga, uh, that in order for that, I, I was, had all this terrible karma coming my way, thanks to you know, what I was eating, and therefore I had to change that right away, um, much to my mom's chagrin, uh, because I was 16 at the time, and she was still cooking family meals, and now I was being a real pain in the neck. Anyway, she, had, she adjusted. Um, because I held my ground on it. And anyway, so this was a very early realization for me that this is just necessary if I'm going to make uh, spiritual progress. And therefore, now that uh, Krishna is speaking in more general terms, uh, because this now applies to everyone, we're no longer thinking about specific stages of life or specific positions in the social structure or anything like that. These are now uh, global, universal qualities of saintliness. So that's where he starts this verse is with nonviolence. Uh, satyam means that one should be truthful. It also means one should not distort the truth for some personal interest. Uh, <laughs> Here in Washington, D.C., uh, congressional hearings are a spectator sport. So wherever else you are in the world, uh, you know, you may not be glued to the impeachment inquiry that is going on right now. Uh, I have gotten kind of sucked into the Washingtonian thing of paying attention to this stuff. Uh, I try to tune it out while I get other more valuable work done. Uh, but as of this recording, that's what's going on right now. And so we're uh, seeing some pretty interesting ways of spinning facts in order to create a desired narrative. Um, 
So satyam means you accept uh, the self-evident truth without putting a spin on it for some personal interest. And you can decide for yourself uh, who's doing that or not. Akrodha means uh, to be free from anger or to be able to check one's anger. Uh, once again, negating prefix krodha, anger. So uh, even if there's provocation, one should find a way to be uh, tolerant because uh, when we get angry, that changes the chemistry of our body. Our whole body come, becomes polluted by anger. And that also then affects the mind. Um, and it becomes like a feedback loop. You, you get angry in your mind, it gets into your body, it feeds back into your mind, which gets back into your body. And you know this is how anger spins out of control. Um, anger is a combination of the mode of passion and selfish desire. We get angry when we don't get what we want. Uh, and one who is saintly is more concerned about how to be of service to others rather than getting what they want. That is to say, selflessness is a saintly quality. Therefore, uh, someone who is uh, blessed with selflessness is less likely to get angry on account of the absence of selfish desires. Next comes uh, renunciation, uh, which means not having a sense of ownership of things, not thinking I, me, mine, uh, that things belong to me. And with that comes tranquility, because, and which is the next quality. Because when you're not trying to hold on to something that doesn't really belong to you, then that's a pretty peaceful condition. And if you can't take it with you, then uh, you're just a renter. You're borrowing, but you're not owning. The next one, uh, not finding fault with others. Uh, that doesn't mean that you're not honest about using good judgment when someone uh, has done something wrong it means you don't go out of your way to find fault with someone. Uh, you don't uh, go out of your way to correct them unnecessarily uh, if it's really not your position to do that, that sort of thing. Uh, it never ceases to amaze me uh, how I can become uh, absorbed in finding fault with others. And when we look for it, that's usually when it shows up. Uh, that's when we realize how often it really happens. Uh, next, mercy toward other living entities. So mercy means giving what is not deserved, as opposed to justice, which means giving what is deserved. So being merciful, uh, means not considering whether one is deserving or undeserving, just being kind and generous to everyone without requiring some pre-qualification like that. Um, freedom from greed is next. Uh, once again, not uh, wanting to acquire more than what comes your way by a just reasonable effort and the will of providence. Uh, gentleness uh, and modesty. Uh, not seeking uh, praise. Uh, also, um, not showing off. You know, not being a big showboat. Um, the next one, uh, achapalam, means uh, determination. Uh, what this means is that uh, one should not be too discouraged by failure, but rather should simply uh, continue to be uh, patient and determined to move forward rather than getting uh, hung up on temporary setbacks. And all setbacks are temporary. Uh, it's just a question of degree. So, uh, not being uh, frustrated uh, 
or unduly frustrated uh, in one's endeavors. Uh, simply uh, moving forward with patience and determination. And that takes us to the end of this verse. And if you have any questions or comments about this verse, please go ahead and pop them in the chat. And we'll see how much time we have to go through the remaining verses. I may have been a little optimistic about moving through everything. So the next verse, verse three, once again, vigor, forgiveness, fortitude, cleanliness, freedom from envy and from the passion for honor. These transcendental qualities, O son of part, belong to godly men or people endowed with divine nature. Uh, so here, men meaning, meaning human beings. The first one, teja, vigor, uh, tejas. Uh, this is for everyone, but it's specifically for the warriors. They should be very vigorous in uh, battle. They should be vigorous in um, the uh, execution of their uh, duties to maintain social order, uh, etc. But it, it applies to everyone. It applies to students, uh, those who have uh, heard the, what is called the, uh, sometimes called the peace mantra. It, it, it contains the peace mantra at the end, Om Shanti 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 Hi. Uh, but there's a particular mantra chanted uh, by student and teacher together. There's a line, Tejasvi na vaditam astu, which means may we work together with vigor. So this is the same word, Tejas. Uh, forgiveness, not holding a grudge. Um, fortitude, uh, being steady. Um, having strength, having courage. Uh, resilience, uh, endurance would be another uh, word. Uh, the next word, shaucha, means cleanliness. Uh, cleanliness of body, of course, but also of the mind, and also purity in one's dealings with other people. So uh, a more esoteric meaning would apply to uh, vaishas, uh, people engaged in business deals no shady deals, uh, no under the table stuff, no quid pro quo. The next, uh, freedom from envy, not expecting honor. So there's a very nice uh, verse from a set of verses that are given specifically as uh, instructions for mantra meditation, for chanting the uh, Hare Krishna mantra, uh, given by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who is uh, the uh, great uh, saint of Krishna Bhakti, who appears in around the uh, 16th century, beginning of the uh, 16th century. And one of the verses speaks to this specifically. Uh, one who thinks themselves lower than the grass, who is more tolerant than a tree, and who does not expect personal honor, but is always prepared to give all respect to others, can very easily and always chant the holy name of the Lord. So this is a nice thing to think about if mantra meditation is part of your practice, this idea that it's a very easy to engage in this practice if one cultivates humility, which includes not expecting other people to honor you, not looking to be honored by others. So Krishna wraps this up. That's our uh, last of the 26 qualities, uh, Atimanita. Uh, no expectation of honor. And these are considered transcendental qualities as opposed to what comes up next, which are the six demonic qualities. But before I move on to those, 
uh, please let me know if you have any questions or comments about what we just covered in the third verse. And I'll keep an eye out for your questions while I uh, move ahead to the royal road to hell, which is about to be described. Uh, pride, arrogance, conceit, anger, harshness, and ignorance. These qualities belong to those of a demonic nature, O son of Brita. Uh, so one of the things to look for in modern culture is how these six things find their way into what a lot of people would commonly consider normalcy or even uh, virtue. We're going to hear later about how in the mode of ignorance, one considers irreligion to be religion and religion to be irreligion. So one of the ways to gauge whether something that's being sold to us as virtuous or even religious is to look to see if these qualities are there. If we find harshness, anger, conceit, arrogance, pride, or ignorance. Well, these aren't saintly qualities. Uh, they're just the opposite. And therefore someone may be selling you a bill of goods if uh, they're selling you a package that says this is virtuous and it has these qualities. So something to keep your eye on here out for what passes for virtue and religion in Kali Yuga. Verse five, the transcendental qualities are conducive to liberation whereas the demonic qualities make for bondage. So here, uh, what Krishna is speaking about is liberation uh, or entanglement in uh, material nature. That is to say, uh, one who cultivates these trans, has or cultivates these transcendental qualities, uh, gradually disentangles oneself from material nature and its associated problems, namely uh, birth, death, uh, disease, and old age. Uh, whereas these other qualities are going to deepen one's entanglement. One gets ensnared like a, you know, a, a fly in a spider web, uh, thrashing about in material nature when one acts on the basis of these uh, demonic qualities, uh, and therefore is subject to uh, more and more of the difficulties, problems associated with life in the material world, namely having a material body, and uh, perhaps uh, taking a birth that is not so conducive to the elevation of consciousness and the purification of the heart. Uh, this is also a vindication of Arjuna's involvement in fighting. He, uh, Krishna says next, do not worry, O son of Pandu, you are born with the divine qualities. So what Krishna is saying here is you, if you go ahead and fight the way I'm encouraging you to, uh, because you're not acting under the influence of anger or false prestige or harshness, because you actually are a thoughtful person who, who uh, considered the pros and cons of all of this and, and had a, a compassionate nature wanting, you want to do the right thing and you're just trying to figure out what that right thing is. Well, you know, that's an indication that you have divine qualities. You're, you're not uh, motivated by pride or arrogance or conceit or anger uh, or harshness uh, or ignorance. You, you're under the influence of a little ignorance right now, but I'm fixing that problem for you as we speak, as I speak. So you should go ahead and fight. That's not gonna make you a demonic 
person. These qualities are what make you a demonic person, not fighting for the right reason, which is what Arjuna is being encouraged to do, which brings us to verse number six, uh, our last verse for the evening. O son of Prita, there are two kinds of beings in this world. One is called divine, the other demonic. And I have already explained to you at length the divine qualities. Now hear from me of the demonic. So in the past chapters, Krishna has mentioned four kinds of people who never uh, approach him uh, and four kinds of people who do. And then he elaborates on those who are wise and those who have knowledge, on those who are pure of heart, who, those who offer themselves to Krishna uh, and with whom he reciprocates in a loving relationship. So even though he's mentioned the kind of people who are ne'er-do-wells, so to speak, in past chapters, he hasn't really gotten into that in a lot of detail. He spent much more of his time uh, glorifying those who have uh, undertaken the practice of yoga and have therefore acquired some sense of transcendental knowledge uh, and have developed a relationship with him. Now he's going to explain about uh, demonic qualities in detail. And this is one of the uh, really challenging chapters or portions of the Bhagavad Gita, because what we're about to see in the verses that follow is a lot of what we think is normal. And if you're like me, um, it's a little like looking in the mirror. So that takes a little bit of effort and uh, humility to get through uh, to possibly accept that there are plenty of things we think of as normal or even desirable or that we see in ourselves that we now find out as far as Krishna is concerned, these are demonic uh, characteristics uh, meant to be cured by the process of yoga. It's a kind of uh, spiritual disease that Krishna is giving us the medicine for. And that gives you something to look forward to. So with that, we wrap it up for this evening. Uh, Javier, you're, uh, Javier, you're welcome. Uh, I'm glad you like my explanation. Uh, tonight's class, The Yoga of Differentiating Between Divine and Demonic Natures, we covered characteristics of saintly people, characteristics of demonic people, and I suppose by now you've got an idea of which Krishna thinks is better. So if you have any questions, uh, now's a good time, uh, or, I mean, no time like the present, but if you have questions later, or if you're watching later, Hari at harikirtana.com. I'm always anxious to hear from you. And for those of you who have written to me in the past week and I haven't gotten back to you yet, please uh, have faith that I have not forgotten about you. Uh, I always like to uh, give your correspondence uh, some thought and uh, invest a little bit of time in uh, replying to you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you like that. Okay. Next week, here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about vultures and jackals and Putin and fracking. And if you know what I'm talking about, you get an A in the civics class. Uh, lust, anger, and greed will also be part of our discussion. We will cover verses 7 through 12. And da -dip, da -dip, da -dip. that's all, folks. Kavita, you're uh, very welcome, my pleasure. Uh, thank you all very much for being here. I'm always so very, very happy to see you all here and to know that you are there if you are watching this after the fact. Uh, it's a great honor to have you spending time with me uh, discussing the Bhagavad Gita and always a great pleasure for me to be here with you. And now I will not be here with you. I will end this meeting for all. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your evening uh, and uh, or wherever your final destination may be.